Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we pray that we be planted by the water of life, that our roots, our roots would be deep enough to reach down and to draw nourishment, and that we would be able to bear the fruit that we are called to bear. Amen. So today for the sermon, I'm going to be focusing on this idea of blessings and curses. This comes up obviously in both of our readings this morning. In Jeremiah, we have woe and woes and blessings, and in the more familiar text perhaps from Luke 6, we have blessings and curses. Luke 6, this is the Sermon on the Plain, or in one translation, it was a Sermon on the Plateau, which I thought was interesting. I don't know how many plateaus there are in Judea, but a sermon on a flat land to, um, to highlight its difference uh, in location, at least, from the Sermon on the Mount. But like the Sermon on the Mount, it's relatively familiar, I think. Even being familiar, um, of course, all of us want blessing. All of us want to focus on blessing. Blessing for ourselves, blessing for others. We don't want to think about the curses, the woes. There is very little demand uh, for sermons about curses and for sermons about woes. I can vouch for that. Um, but they're paired together. They come together in almost every case, and they come together throughout Scripture. In Proverbs, you have blessings and curses. In Psalms, in the prophetic texts, including Jeremiah, in Jesus' own teaching, these are often paired ideas. Blessings and curses, zero and one, uh, carrot and stick. This dichotomy is in there again and again. And so, to talk about one, I think you need to talk about the other and how they contrast and where each comes from. So to be clear, my interpretation is that God intends blessing. That God created the world and said it was very good. And God called Abraham and said, I will bless you to be a blessing. That God's intent is to share blessings. And what happens is that the curse or the woe results from when we reject that blessing. Or maybe reject the terms under which God wants to bless us. Just to clarify that God's intent isn't, you know, blessing for you, curse for you. It's blessing for everyone, and then woe to you who walk away from that. What God intends is a community of equality called the kingdom of God, where we care for one, each other, for one another. And the curse comes when we oppress or exclude or exploit. We may not want to hear that, but it's very real. And it's throughout Scripture. And it's as much of an issue for us now as it was for the original audience of these various texts. One curse that comes to mind for me as I think about what does it look like, what does the curse look like, I think of poverty. And this came to me as I was looking at, I was studying this passage from Jeremiah. And this text in the passage that says uh, that one will be like a tree planted by water, in contrast to a tree in a desolate salt wilderness. That verb, planted, in Hebrew is actually transplanted, which I I didn't know that. But that's what the commentary told me. I'm not a master of Hebrew. And so what that kind of highlighted in this text is that what the author is imagining is it's the same tree. That this tree that is in the desolate salt place is withering and unable to survive a drought. But when it is transplanted to better soil next to water, it's able to survive and it isn't anxious 
when a drought comes. And more than that, it can bear fruit. And then immediately after the text talks about bearing fruit, it reminds us that God gives to those according to the fruit that they bear. As I thought about this idea of transplanting, I thought about how important it is where you're located. Like, it could be as simple as where you live, like what neighborhood, or where you're located in society, what your status is. And how many of the things in our lives that happen, for good or ill, woe, curses, or blessing, are based on where we are located. And how much of that isn't under our control? And thinking about this, and some of the things that are going on now and that I'm thinking about currently, I thought about segregation. Because I thought about this idea of some in a desolate place wither and some in a rich and rewarding place flourish. And that the difference is, at least in the metaphor, the location. And that people can be transplanted from one to another, and a person experiencing desolation can be transplanted and experience flourishing. And it made me think of segregation, which I remember thinking that segregation was a historical issue, right? And in, in, in school, I learned that segregation was a problem, but then we fixed it, and now it's gone. And then later as an adult, I learned that segregation is a worse problem in a lot of ways now than it was like in the 1960s. Many of us have heard, probably from the pulpit, someone quote Martin Luther King Jr. saying that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in American society each week. And 60 years after he said that, it is still true. It is, if you look at it, it's still a fact. Schools now are segregated more than they were in the 1960s. Neighborhoods are segregated, housing is segregated, funding is segregated. One of the amazing things that I learned a while back is, do you know the number one factor that will determine how long you live? More than your BMI, more than your blood pressure, your cholesterol, more than every other measure of your life, the number one measure that if a social scientist looks at, they can estimate how long you will live is your zip code. It's your zip code. That is the biggest determiner, literally, of whether you live or die. And how you live and when you die, it's your zip code. And of course, we're in America, and so zip code is also a placeholder for a lot of other things, like poverty, like race and ethnicity, like educational background, all those sorts of things. But your zip code is the number one determiner, more than education, more than everything else you could measure, of the duration of your life. And you can take someone who's doing great and move them to a new zip code, and they will die earlier. And you can take one who's struggling, and you can move them to a better zip code, and they will live longer and live a better life. And for me, that's a vivid illustration of this idea of living in a place of flourishing versus living in a desolate place. And think about that. Where you end up in your zip code, especially when you're born and growing up, is entirely out of your control. And in a lot of cases, it's not entirely in your control after that. I talked about segregation, in this case, specifically racial segregation. Still a problem today, uh, 60 or 70 years after civil rights activists were talking about it, after I was taught that we fixed it. Maybe you were taught the same, I don't know. But the thing about segregation is it is not an accident. It is not an accident. It isn't a thing that just happens. Oops, we segregated the entire country. The reason I know it's not an accident is because if, we th if it was an accident, as soon as someone pointed it out, we could fix it. 
Like if you do something that's accidental, even if it harms someone, and they point it out, you try to fix it. That's just the human thing to do. And so if segregation was an accident, if it arose randomly, just, you know, a strange circumstance, people could point it out and we could work together and we could fix it. We could have fixed it many times over at this point. But every time it comes up and we have an opportunity to fix it and it's pointed out what a problem that it is, we double down. It's been true, you may remember, uh, in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, right? Supposedly struck down the idea of separate but equal schooling and supposedly was the first step in ending school segregation. Well, school segregation is worse now than it was then. And people right now are outside this, the Capitol in Harrisburg holding vigils and protesting and holding up signs and chanting and singing and writing letters and making phone calls and visiting lawmakers' offices begging for them to change this because they have an opportunity to once again. But every single time this has come up, we've failed to change it. And that tells me it's not an accident. It must be something that we're doing. And what's behind this, I'm afraid, and I observe in many other situations, what's behind this is what I think is a deeply held belief that many people have. And that belief is that for you, for me to be blessed requires you to be cursed. For me to be blessed requires that you be cursed. For me to be, there's only so much room on, on the riverside for only so many trees. And so if I'm planted by the riverside and you're in the desolate salt land, whew, tough luck. But I am not going to transplant you. Because for me to be blessed, you have to be cursed. That's the only way I can explain this. That must be the thinking behind the situation. Or else we'd fix it. So obviously, Valentine's Day is coming up, which I know is a very diagonal move. But it's a day when we celebrate love. Obviously, primarily romantic love. But I thought about what could be more loving than a commitment to the idea that everyone can flourish. That everyone is able to receive a blessing. What could be more loving than that, even if it requires transplanting. If we know people are living in a desolate salt land, and if we know that if we transplanted them, they could flourish, and we say we love them, what follows? Could be time for a transplant. Because this idea that a blessing for me requires a curse for you is anathema to the kingdom of God. It has no place in the kingdom of God whatsoever. Because God is the one who blesses those who bless. God blesses us so that we can bless others. That is the whole purpose. God causes some to flourish so that they can cause others to flourish. That is the point. And that is the fruit for those of us who may be flourishing. That is the fruit we are called to bear. And that is the fruit on which we will be judged. Not whether we enjoy our time by the riverside, but whether we bear the fruit of other people's flourishing. God's like, I gave you this blessing. What are you going to do with it? rather than keep people planted in a desolate place to wither under what is essentially our curse. Something we inflict, something we collectively could choose not to inflict anymore, 
but we collectively choose to continue inflicting. Jesus' teachings are very often about the kingdom of God. Jesus taught and continues to teach us through the text that the kingdom of God is present in him, and it is present in any of us who say that we follow him. The kingdom of God is present in Christ, and if we're following Christ, it is present in us as well. And so I read these blessings in the text today, and I don't read them as passive. I don't read them as a situation where we sit back and we say, oh great, God is going to bless those people. Sounds wonderful, get to it, God, and sit back and enjoy the place where we are. I think we are called to bless the poor with resources. We are called to bless the hungry with food. We are also called to bless those who weep with laughter and joy. We're called to bless those who are hated, excluded, reviled, defamed through no fault of their own. We are blessed to be a blessing. Because theirs is the kingdom of God. The people who live under the curse that we inflict, guess what? Theirs is the kingdom of God. It's theirs. And if we want to be part of the kingdom of God, we never will be. As long as we believe and behave as if our blessing requires their curse. Amen.